Hello Zero Books readers and viewers, it's me again, Douglas Lane, and in this video, I'll be responding to the new Adam Curtis documentary series, Can't Get You Out of My Head, and to the recently published Zero Books title, Democracy Under Siege by Frank Ferretti. The Critical Cuts videos on this channel are quite consciously styled after the montage documentaries of Adam Curtis. Films such as The Trap, Hypernormalization, The Century of the Self, all watched over by machines of loving grace, and it felt like a kiss. Not only were influential aesthetically, but Curtis's polemics about the power of individuals and ideas, and the history of when those ideas have gone wrong, set me off on a quest to create my own mashups of archived film footage with the aim of assisting the liberation of humanity. But what I didn't realize was that Rather than being part of the struggle for socialism and human freedom, Adam Curtis's ideas were actually products of a deeply conservative worldview, an ideology that believes itself to be beyond politics and power. In a 2014 interview for the journal Film Comment that was later quoted in a Wikipedia article, the filmmaker clarified what his films are really all about. In the interview, Curtis claimed both to be a kind of neoconservative and to be lamenting the loss of communal values and a kind of individualist or libertarian value. Ultimately, Curtis explained that he was very much a creature of his time and that he didn't really have any politics. He, like everyone else, has abandoned politics and power in favor of a seemingly never-ending and repeating critique. In fact, the real power of his films and their message has never derived from any positive prescription. But, by coming at any given subject from a multiplicity of perspectives, registers, and times, Curtis manages to land both rhetorically successful and even penetratingly accurate critiques of the left. It is a way he catalogs our impotence, picking out all the species and subspecies of our failures that gives his work both significance and meaning. And it is precisely for this reason that today's left so desperately needs his films. The repetition of images and songs is justified by the pressing need to drill the reality of failure into an otherwise myopically optimistic left's head. Well, the first thing we should remember is that Sanders' campaign was a remarkable success. Curtis's critiques of populism and techno-progressivism, psychology and mindless consumerism, bankers and factory owners, consumerism and poverty may be contradictory, but it is for this reason that the critiques tend to reach their targets. In a world riven with contradiction, a man with a copy of the film Tiger Dance, starring the burlesque dancer Sherry North, and a CD's worth of ambient music can truly capture reality if his cuts are properly timed. At the end of the final episode of Adam Curtis's latest film, Can't Get You Out of My Head, the filmmaker sums up his docuseries by suggesting that what is lacking in the modern world is confidence in human subjectivity and in freedom. Instead of engaging with the real world and its problems, we have given in to conspiracy theories and other illusions in order to avoid changing. We've created a virtual world to hide in, but this world has also become a strange nightmare. What makes Curtis's description and critique difficult to pin down, however, is that the difference between the fantasy world of AI hallucination and the real world of dead malls, inequality, bombing campaigns, and COVID is difficult to make out. Curtis begins this film series with a quote from the late David Graeber. Quote, The ultimate hidden truth of the world is that it is something we make, and could just as easily make differently. This sounds like both a deep and obvious truth. However, it is, I think, too simple. I would revise Graeber's revelation, rewrite it this way. 
The ultimate hidden truth of society is that it is the unintended result of the way we produce and distribute the things we need to survive. We could, with a great effort, arrange our productive activities differently. I think the difference between these two versions of the hidden truth is essential. It's the difference between anarchism and Marxism. And it might also be the difference between a materialist and an idealist conception of the world. In his recent book, Democracy Under Siege, Frank Ferretti gives an argument that would be right at home in an Adam Curtis documentary. He writes, Political psychology has often served as a medium for diseasing the demos, and by implication, democracy itself. In the 19th century, psychologists developed theories of the crowd, which stressed the irrational and destructive behavior of the urban mobs. In the current era, citizens supporting so-called populist parties are diagnosed as possessing toxic authoritarian personalities. Psychology's contribution to the silent war against democracy has been in serving to depoliticize and medicalize the behavior of its target. Views that inspire and motivate popular movements are dismissed as the outcomes of psychological pathologies, narcissism, irrationalism, deluded fantasy, rather than as legitimate political responses to public problems. He goes on to quote the social critic Christopher Lash, a figure who has been featured prominently on this channel and who has become a hero for what's sometimes called the dirtbag left. Ferretti wrote that Lash argued that by equating mental health with left-wing politics and by associating right-wing politics with an invented authoritarian pathology, the goal was to eliminate authoritarianism by subjecting the American people to what amounted to collective psychotherapy by treating them as inmates in an insane asylum. Adam Curtis made similar observations in Can't Get You Out of My Head and in his documentary series, The Trap, wherein he tells the story of how millions of people became convinced that they were mentally ill as psychiatrists began to use surveys and computers to discover who had the symptoms of an array of new disorders that were themselves only collections of symptoms. The new approaches to psychology and diagnosing mental illnesses that arose in the 70s and 80s became, perhaps inadvertently, a new mechanism of control. Both Ferretti and Curtis are convinced that the idea that power should rest with citizens in a democratic society has been undermined as those citizens were deemed to be irrational and sick. But what Ferretti and Curtis don't seem to realize is that the citizens in a modern democracy, while perhaps not mentally ill, are set into opposition, driven into antisocial behavior by the material interests that arise under capitalism. For Ferretti, this failure to understand how bourgeois democracies are inherently fractured by class interests and how this leads to the development of a managerial state is surprising, given that he was, in 1978, the founder of the Revolutionary Communist Party in the UK. Even as late as 2012, Ferretti was giving lectures on Marx at the Academy of Ideas. But it's worth noting what he said there. Discovering what goes on, and, and we know, for example, when he writes in Volume 3 of Capital, he makes the point about how in ancient Rome it was politics, and in the Middle Ages it was Catholicism that reigned supreme. He doesn't say that in ancient Rome it was a slave economy, <laughs> right? And he doesn't say that in medieval Europe it was just serf economy. He didn't write a critique of Roman political economy because there was no political economy in Rome. Right? He wrote a critique of political economy because at his lifetime it was political economy, particularly in its Scottish form, that for him represented the most interesting and the clearest <coughs> expressions of what he took to be fundamental relationships within society. So there's no kind of fixed relationship. Now, I looked for this quote from Volume 3 of Capital and didn't find it. I did, however, find it in a footnote 
contained in Volume 1. Some had objected to Marx's characterization of the base directing or determining the superstructure by saying that in the Middle Ages, it was Catholicism which reigned supreme, and in ancient Athens, it was politics. Marx responded by saying, in the first place, it strikes one as an odd thing for anyone to suppose that these well-worn phrases about the Middle Ages and the ancient world are unknown to anyone else. This much, however, is clear, that the Middle Ages could not live on Catholicism, nor the ancient world on politics. On the contrary, it is a mode in which they gained a livelihood that explains why here politics and there Catholicism played the chief part. Somewhere along the line, it seems, Ferretti lost his grip on Marx and, whether inadvertently or not, turned him upside down. He turned him, in other words, into an idealist. This may explain why it is that he has spent decades trying to protect bourgeois freedoms and rights while simultaneously abandoning the role that the working class must play in changing the base of society. If we are to protect these freedoms or realize them, we will have to change not just the law or the market or people's heads, but the foundation of society. And yet despite this mistake, despite the failure of both Curtis and Ferretti to take up the need for a change in the way we produce the world of culture, ideologies, politics, and the rest, rather than a change in the world of culture, ideologies, and politics in themselves, they are still necessary thinkers for this moment. They have regressed back to 1789 or maybe 1849, but they have not gone so far as to embrace the House of Stuart as the supposed radicals who pushed the 1619 project did. They at least still long for human subjectivity to return, even if they don't quite realize that the only way to truly grasp human subjectivity is through a working class revolution and through the transformation of the material world. Thanks for watching this Zero Books video. If you enjoyed it, subscribe to this channel and click on the notifications bell so that you'll be alerted whenever we release a new video. You should also consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons get access to our Inside Zero Books podcast every week and can get access to the Zero Books book club and help us to continue making online content from the left.